You adulterous bitch! Shame on you! My mother-in-law threw a bunch of photographs at me, stupidly claiming they were legitimate proof of my affair. Now, sign the divorce papers. You don't deserve to be married to my son. Mrs. Dixon, you lost me at adulteress. Can you explain to me, in simple English, what it is you're talking about? My mother-in-law didn't listen to a single word I said and continued yelling at the top of her lungs. And for some reason, my husband, who was standing next to her, turned deathly pale and started trembling out of control. At this point, I knew that something was wrong. And then literally the very next moment, I learned the shocking truth and the room turned into a scene of catastrophe. My name is Melanie Dixon and I'm 28 years old. I work as an architect, which I have always wanted to be since I was a child. I don't know how I first fell in love with structure initially, but I have countless childhood memories of feeling inspired whenever I beheld almighty skyscrapers, historical buildings, castles, and churches. Of the three, the contemporary buildings, the skyscrapers, were especially captivating in my eyes. And I made it my life's objective to work in that industry. After graduating from a four-year university with a degree in architecture, I obtained my first class architect license after two years of work experience. And now I'm mainly in charge of revitalizing old crumbling buildings. I basically collaborate with construction companies and other architects about how a particularly old building could be structurally strengthened and perhaps even be expanded to better suit the community's needs. I take so much pride in my work, which is not just about creating something new out of something old, but also about bringing new life into things of old. My head is always filled with blueprints and schematics. And even after I started this job, I had a hard time finding a boyfriend, even when I went to a blind date party at the invitation of a friend of mine. But the men there were so taken aback by my raw passion for my work that they didn't seem interested in talking to me at all. I thought to myself, am I really going to be without a boyfriend for the rest of my life? Am I really going to be alone until the end of my days? That's what I was thinking to myself as I was walking home from the party. But then I noticed someone was running behind me, trying to catch up. When I turned around, a man stopped in front of me out of breath. Miss Melanie, please wait a moment. It was a man who had been at the party earlier and was sitting the furthest away from me. I looked at him in surprise. I was so impressed by your enthusiasm for your work and I was wondering if it's all right with you. If we could get to know each other a little more. I know a nice little bar nearby with a nice atmosphere and they serve the most amazing apple pie I've ever had. And my aunt's a baker. This was the beginning of our friendship and naturally, we wound up dating not too long thereafter, and a year later, we got married. My husband's name is Vance. He is two years older than me and works in another office. Whenever I completed a piece of my work, Vance would be as happy as if it were his own accomplishment. And that feeling was the best thing he could have ever given me, with the exception of a child. He had a steady schedule of holidays and I often had to work on weekends and holidays. So we did what we could for each other around the house. I thought we were a balanced couple. However, my mother-in-law did not seem to think well of me. Whenever I came home from work on holidays or weekends, my Mrs. Dixon was always at my home. What's a woman to do? When she's so preoccupied with her work, Melanie, dear. You're married now, and you really need to calm down a little. Or, on another day, she would say something along the lines of, I think it's strange for a company to make a woman work on her days off. I think you should quit your job as soon as possible. It's a wife's job to take care of her husband and the house on her days off. I suggest you live up to that. The sarcastic bickering of Mrs. Dixon was the contrast in my life for some time. But at first, I thought that if I merely ignored her, it would go away. That's why I didn't pay much attention to her when, when we first got married. 
But even after a long time, the bickering persisted, and a human being can only be so patient before her limit has been reached. What was especially frustrating was that she never did any of that when Vance was in the room with us. The moment he walked out, she had at it. I was getting really fed up with her bullshit, so I decided to talk to Vance about it. I can't stand your mother's sarcasm anymore, honey. What's wrong with you all of a sudden? Every time I come home from work, my mother-in-law says things like, How can a woman work? It's like she doesn't think I need a passion in life because my passion should be taking care of you. And it is, but you of all people know that I, I can't just stop thinking about architecture, right? I do, and I respect it. But I think she's just worried about your health, Melanie. I wouldn't worry about it too much. But if she keeps asking me to quit my job, the stress is only going to get worse, Vance. I think it's about time you told her to stop her nonsense, as her only son. He seemed to be thinking about it for a while after I told him this. Hmm. Well, let's be rational here. I love you for who you are. Your borderline obsessive passion for your work included. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to her about it so that she doesn't act pesky about you working your schedule. He thankfully promised me that he would talk to Mrs. Dixon about my dissatisfaction. The next Saturday, I found Mrs. Dixon at home when I came home from work. Vance was in the house, but not in the room, and she made a sarcastic remark to me the moment I walked into the living room. Did you have a work day today again, Melanie? You said you're working, but you're really just going off gallivanting with people somewhere, aren't you, Mrs. Dixon? I'm not the gallivanting type. I swear to you, on my love for your son, when I say I'm going to work, I am going to work. Hmm, you're such a sassy wife, talking back to me like that. Then, my husband came to the rescue. Just as you'd expect, Mrs. Dixon's demeanor died away the moment her son walked into the room and asked him how he's doing. In response, Vance said, Mom, listen. I love Melanie for who she is. She works hard at her job, and the twinkle in her eyes she gets when she talks about her work is so bright. It's not your place to tell her what to do. Maybe it isn't. But I'm afraid you'll have a hard time coping with your life at home when your wife is always working so much. Besides, I'm worried about you when you're going to be having kids. And an overworking wife is not going to be good for their development. Perhaps her arguments had good points to consider. But I wasn't really open to listening to her excuses for causing me a hard time. She glared at me as she said so. Again... Vance gently followed through with his defense. Mom, we'll be fine. Besides, we were just talking about having kids soon. I hope so. I really want to see the adorable face of my grandchild soon. I was relieved when Mrs. Dixon finally agreed, albeit reluctantly. That night, I went to the bedroom to go to bed, tired from the day's work. My husband handed me a gift with a ribbon on it. I hope you like it. He said as he fidgeted somewhat shyly. A surprise gift? Well, why, thank you, honey. I, I opened it and found some undergarments that had a large pink ribbon on the bra. My voice involuntarily gave a yelp. I was so surprised at this unexpected present. I thought it would look good on you, Melanie, so I bought it for you. Vance said as he grimaced like a little boy would when he put a large ice cube down his mother's back. A smile with a bit of mischief, a bit of pride, a bit of hope for attention. Oh, thank you. It's very nice, and thanks for buying it for me. In reality, I despise it. It was the complete opposite of my taste. I'm glad you bought it for me, but I'm sorry. I I'm just not in the mood tonight. I'll try it on next time, okay? I think anyone would have noticed the smile on my face was as forced as someone trying to smile when they broke their leg. He didn't say anything at the time. But after that day, I began to notice a strange change in his behavior. We had been talking about having children since we got married. But when I said, 
I think it's time to start thinking seriously about it, honey. About having kids. He responded, and he was fiddling with his phone. No, I don't think we need to have kids yet. He replied in a way that made it clear that he was no longer interested. After that day, my husband started working late and even on his days off. I was suspicious at first. But then I saw a flyer in town about an event organized by his office, so he had good reason to appear a lot busier at his work. A few days later, Ben suggested we go to my in-law's house for the first time in a while. Dad wants us to come over for some coffee, some dessert, and some chit-chat. How about it? I loved the idea, and the day before we went, I bought a small present to thank them for their hospitality. I was a little nervous as I headed over with my husband, clutching the present. We arrived at my in-law's house, and Mr. Dixon opened the front door and greeted us warmly. Ah, Melanie, my darling child. Come in, come in. It's been a while since I've seen you, Mr. Dixon. Here, a little something to thank you for inviting us. These are my favorite cookies. You really have the most amazing taste in sweets, my dear. Thank you for coming all this way. Mr. Dixon was pretty much the kindest, funniest soul to ever walk this earth. His smile was extremely contagious, and he invited us into the living room. We drank tea and munched on the cookies I bought, talking about this and that for a while. But no sooner had I first set foot inside the living room that I noticed my mother-in-law was being pretty fidgety and restless. I wondered if she had just been as nervous as I was, or if she didn't get much sleep last night. Either way, she wasn't herself, and I grew increasingly concerned. And then the intercom rang. Coming, coming. Mrs. Dixon rushed to the door, looking very happy for some reason. Mr. Dixon and I looked at each other, clueless about what was going on. Then Mrs. Dixon shouted out my name in a very loud voice. Melanie? She came storming back into the living room with a devilish look on her face and threw a few photographs at me as she continued to yell. You adulterous bitch! Shame on you! I looked at the pictures and saw a man and I going into a hotel. She angrily said that on her way home from shopping one day, she caught me walking with a strange man she didn't recognize and obviously thought that was suspicious, so she followed us. She did a great job because I never noticed her following us around, and then she saw us going into a sleazy-looking hotel. I then took the liberty of hiring a detective agency to get this evidence for me. You've been going to the hotel many times with that man, haven't you? I won't let you get away with this. Fricking sign the divorce papers right here, right now. Mrs. Dixon was snickering at this point with a look of triumph and a smile of sinister intent spreading across her face. She reached into her bag and thrust the divorce papers in my face. I sighed a deep one, shook my head, and said, Mrs. Dixon, that man is Mr. Wilson, and he's my boss at work. The hotel you see us going into in this photograph is dangerously dilapidated. I believe your detective took it when we went down to inspect it because we had a commission to rehabilitate it. That's just a stupid, selfish lie. Enough with the stupid freaking excuses, bitch. Admit you had an affair. While my mother-in-law was insisting I was having an affair, my father-in-law, who was looking over the report that came with the photos as she was yelling at me, quietly handed her the paper. That was the same report that they initially saw, of course, and it clearly stated that Mrs. Melanie Dixon and Mr. Brandon Wilson, the two individuals in the photograph, only have a professional relationship. There is no need to doubt Miss Melanie's fidelity to her husband. One, Mr. Vance Dixon. That's what it said, word for word. This implied that my mother-in-law had completely disregarded the conclusion of the investigation and convinced herself that I was having an affair just by looking at the photographs. After realizing she was gravely mistaken, 
She plopped down onto an armchair and sat there with a look of embarrassment on her face. Then Vance, who was sitting next to me, got a little upset and said, Damn, Mom. You got a bit too hasty right there. You startled me when you made such a fuss about Melody cheating on me. He laughed, but anyone could tell the laugh was not genuine. Something was definitely bothering him. Then my husband's cell phone rings. He shuddered for a split second and then stopped moving. The ringtone kept on going, but for some reason, he would not answer it. I became suspicious of this and told him that the phone was ringing. It's my boss anyway. I don't have to answer the phone. He's always calling me for some stupid, selfish reason. My husband says this without ever making eye contact with me. I don't think anyone would be convinced by that load of bullshit. Besides, the lack of eye contact, my husband's face was pale and his voice was pretty shaky as if he was desperately trying to hide something. At that moment, Mr. Dixon said to his son, Your boss is calling you at the end of the year. Something might be urgent. I suggest you answer it quickly, boy. As soon as my husband reluctantly pulled his cell phone out of his pocket, I snatched it away from him. Everyone was left stunned by that sudden movement. Vance was the first to snap out of the stunned silence. He frantically tries to take the phone back from me with a terrible fierceness. Mr. Dixon, please check the name of the caller ID. I threw the phone to him. Mr. Dixon partially discombobulated by his sudden onset tug of war between me and Vance, caught the phone with both hands and said the name was on the screen aloud, Eleanor. Mr. Dixon seemed to immediately sense what was going on and read my mind. He pressed the call button on the phone and put it on speaker. Then the woman known as Eleanor started babbling on and on. Vance, my darling, why didn't you pick up right away? My husband didn't answer at first, but finally started to speak under the enormous silent pressure from his father. Sorry, I'm in the middle of something right now. I'll have to call you back later. Oh, my God, you're so cold today. By this point, Vance is sweating so much, it was as though he was going to explode. Anyway, darling, can I see you tonight? Tonight? What are you talking about? Vance was getting very anxious and desperately tried to cover it up somehow. But the other woman didn't understand what was going on and continued with her sleazy seduction. I'll be waiting for you at the hotel in front of the station, as usual, wearing the lingerie you bought me the other day. Your favorite. You make sure you come, all right? Or I'll have to punish you. Aw, are you scared about my punishment? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Is it possible that your wife is listening to this phone call? <laughs> Stupid woman. This confirmed that Vance is cheating on me. Mr. Dixon hung up the phone quietly. Mind explaining that to me? No, you don't understand. This, this is just a prank by a, a friend of mine. You know, uh, it's a trick. It's just a common practical joke. You really expect me to believe that load of bullshit? Who would on this planet of intelligent beings would believe you? You've been cheating on me, admit it. My husband took offense to this. Yeah, 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 I cheated on you. Got a problem with that, eh? What's wrong with that? What the hell are you on about? Of course, I got a problem with that. I mean, what the frick? It's your fault for not being more like the kind of woman I love. Besides, it's just cheating on you for a little fun. You don't have to be so mad about it. It was never serious. Don't be freaking stupid. What was the reason you cheated on me? Was it because I didn't wear the lingerie you thought would suit me? 
And just because it was never serious doesn't mean it's forgivable. You committed adultery, Vance. And serious or not, it has consequences. It's not my fault. You were the blame in all this. And everyone who thinks otherwise can shut the hell up. The person who blew up at that remark was Mr. Dixon. Vance, you still won't admit it. Even when you've lost the war? Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you for calling yourself a man. My father-in-law began to climb over the table in front of me to catch his idiot son. Vance attempts to make his getaway, but Mr. Dixon quickly catches him, tackles him to the ground, and grabs him by the chest, making him wheeze. He then began slapping him so hard that his face was slowly swelling up. Bill, what are you doing? Please stop this. With those words from Mrs. Dixon, he finally stopped his slapping. Vance was left lying on the floor with his face against the floor and his hands clutching his head. Oh, Melanie, I'm so sorry for my son being such an asshole. You never deserved any of this, and I do hope you can forgive me. He said that and bowed his head deeply. But even in such a situation, my mother-in-law seemed to take her son's side and never apologized to me. I asked her for something. Mrs. Dixon, may I have a look at the divorce documents, please? I took the divorce paper that my mother-in-law had just presented to me a few moments ago, filled in my sections, and handed them to my husband. You're divorcing me, and I want you to sign these papers. My husband was silent. I'll never be the woman you want me to be. He started shaking his head sheepishly. Can't we start over? <sighs> what the hell are you on about? No, we can't start over. You've betrayed my trust, and you will never get it back. He sighed deeply as I told him so, and he gave up and graciously signed the divorce papers. All that's left to do is hire a lawyer, and I'm going to demand you for alimony, Vance, so I suggest you prepare yourself. I told him that and went home. Of course, I had no intention of living in the house anymore, so I packed up my belongings and went back to my parents' house. I was worried that I would cause my office some trouble with a bunch of legal matters until this matter was settled, so I contacted Mr. Wilson, my boss, to see if there would be any problems. And they were surprisingly cooperative. Not only did they offer me my accumulated days for paid leave in one go, but they also contacted a well-respected lawyer to help me out with all the legal shit I had to take care of. I asked the lawyer to file a lump sum claim for alimony for my husband and the woman he was having an affair with. The woman who had an affair with Vance was his favorite cabaret girl, and because she didn't know my whereabouts, so she stormed into his company and went on a rampage, claiming that the demands for alimony was unfair. That led Vance's job to find out about the affair, and he resigned from his job soon thereafter because he couldn't stand the rumors in the company anymore. As for me, thanks to my excellent lawyer, Mr. Jimenez, I was able to settle the matter faster than I expected, and I'm very satisfied with the results. I'm currently enjoying a cross-country train trip to use up the rest of my paid vacation time that the company arranged for me. My mind is changing as I spent every day visiting monuments and admiring the local architecture, and I know this will help me so much in my work in the future. My head is still full of blueprints, but now those blueprints are shifting changing, configuring into new ideas, new innovations, and new hopes for a more successful future. For the time being, I'm going to concentrate on my work, experience lots, and live the fullest life I can create. Wish me luck.